Hello again, everyone. I am here with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research, bringing you another Live at Five tour. I am your curator, Kevin Atkinson, and today I thought that we would discuss the beautiful main entrance gates of Cranbrook School, the Peacock Gates. And these are considered the main gates into Cranbrook School. However, there's really no longer any reason that one would actually enter Cranbrook through the Peacock Gates. So this is, of course, the half of the campus of Cranbrook Kingswood Upper School which are the uh, high school students, but it was built as the campus of Cranbrook School for Boys, which were lower forms and upper forms, so grades 7 through 12 came here. And when classes started in September of 1927, uh, this really would have been the main entrance because students uh, largely were either boarding students who lived within the campus or they were day students who walked here they could be dropped off along Lone Pine Road, or they came uh, up the streetcar and then there was a little bus that brought the students to these gates. Today, there's no parking turnaround, there's no uh, parking lot, and so uh, to actually get dropped off on Lone Pine Road would be a little bit uh, in, of insanity on the busy morning rush. That, however, does not diminish the sort of ceremonial function of these being the main entrance gates, as well as the beauty of these exquisite works of iron. Now, if you've been following along with Live at Five, or you know the Cranbrook story well, you know that George Booth himself was an iron worker. So Cranbrook was established by an iron worker, uh, George Booth's father and his grandfather before him and all the way back were coppersmiths in Cranbrook, Kent County, England. George Booth uh, did not learn the copper trade. He learned the iron trade. And so George Booth did architectural ironworks. He did cast ironworks in a little factory in Windsor, Canada, south of Detroit. So George Booth always had this deep and abiding love of iron work and of metal smithing, and we see that in places like the original gates to Cranbrook House. These gates were designed by Aelio Saarinen, and so Cranbrook's architect uh, worked alongside George Booth to create exquisite works of metal around campus. And the maker of these gates, so the design is Aelio Saarinen, then the maker is Oscar Bruno Bach, who I'll talk more about in a moment. But just before we talk about Bach and the maker of these gates, I want to sort of look at the design of the Peacock Gates. We see how Saarinen creates this entrance into the quadrangle that is dominated by this great equilateral triangle pediment across the top. And then there is this rectangular opening that has sort of balanced asymmetry with the limestone and brick elements on either side. And then this rectangular opening that he uses the gate to perfectly divide in half. And it's a really very lacy gate. Um, so the gate is almost um, like a textile or a fabric coming across. It is iron. It's extraordinarily cold, as I just found out uh, as I closed it. Uh, and yet it has this very sort of light, almost curtain appeal to it. And I think the height is interesting because it's you know, for a boy coming in at lower form, seventh grader, it's going to be taller. But then as you grow up, you actually become uh, sort of larger than the gate. And so the, the height of it isn't so much security as it is sort of um, ceremonially marking the change of place as we enter into the school. And then the peacocks are on these sort of wild forms, um, architectural also just exquisitely whimsical, uh, these so where he brings up the sort of line of the gate. He brings in the middle 
all the way up another foot, and then he sort of transforms Iron into these little curly cues and this really interesting balance of ge- geometry with sort of, I don't know, uh, wild abstraction. And then here you have this almost looks like a thistle or a bo- botanic flowering form leading to a, uh, almost maybe an acanthus leaf form growing up to this little bud here. And so it is this combination that Aliel Saarinen uses quite exquisitely all around campus across all different materials from brick and stone and glass and silver uh, here to iron, where it is a balance of geometries and natural forms. And then Sarnan loves inserting sort of mythical creatures and ceremonial creatures. Obviously, peacocks aren't mythical, but they have this certain um, whimsy, this presence to the male and female peacock here. And so they're perched on this strange sort of geometric and botanic form. And then you have the peacock sitting here. And Sarnan uses birds all around campus, but the peacock is his favorite because they are so rich with artistic opportunity. And so you see the way that his tail sort of feathers out. And then I love at the very top of the tail how you get these repeating and reversing Cs. And this is something that you see over at the Nichols Gate where it's all geometric forms, but it's the same idea of the reversing Cs. You see it on the door to the library. You see it in ironwork at Kingswood. And so he takes this geometric motif that he uses all around campus. And here he concludes the peacock tail feather with that motif. Uh, If you're just joining us, welcome to our tour of the peacock gates, which were uh, installed here in 1927. So they were here on the day the school opened or near there. Now, the other peacock, you see his tail is going down, and so you have that same little um, C and reverse C motif uh, happening on the downward tail, and then again sort of near the top. And I love the way that Sarnan ties in the peacock tail feathers to then the construction method of the architect of the the main gate itself. So do you see how this funny little curly cue wraps around? There's a central um, figure sort of point, and then it's actually grouped together using an iron band. And so here it's part of the structure of the gate, but then on the tail feather of the peacock, he repeats that same um, design motif within the way the peacock is constructed. And there are two different construction systems here. Um, Aliel Sarnan is working here in Metro Detroit, the great industrial capital of America, and he really can't be further uh, less interested in industrial production techniques. And so his is not an architecture or design where he's really exploring um, or furthering new ways of construction. And so it's, it's, he's really designed a gate that doesn't quite make sense if you are an iron worker. And then he leaves it up to Oscar Bach as to how to get his design from paper, from a sort of sketch to a full scale drawing and then into iron. And so Bach ends up using multiple techniques on this gate to achieve the architect's vision. My, uh, it's amazing how Aliel is able to take his sort of pencil sketch and keep the sort of whimsy and the freeform nature of the pencil sketch all the way to the end and the building of the gate. And so there's all these little details that you can imagine are just so easy and quick to do with a pencil where you do this little curlicue here and then an entirely different design here, giving us that sort of balanced asymmetry and this idea of surprise and delight. So the further you look at the gate, the more you realize these elements are not symmetrical and the more you realize there are all these little things to notice and that they survive from the initial pencil sketch through to the ironwork is I think a testament to Aliel's skill as a designer 
his demands as the sort of client and then also his iron worker. There's this wonderful sort of um, aquatic sea creature that is the actual handle. Now, the maker of this gate, most of the gates at Cranbrook were made um, by a, ma- a Scotsman, Mr. Burnett, who was the main iron worker here from 1929 to 1933, uh, or by Walter Nichols, who was one of George Booth's iron workers who came up to Cranbrook a little bit later. This piece, however, was made in Manhattan on uh, the east side of Manhattan on East 17th Street in the studio of Oscar Bruno Bach. And Oscar Bach was a German-born metalsmith. He was born in the town of Breslau, which is now in Poland, uh, in 1884. So he was a year younger than Saarinen, a decade younger than the Booths. And Oscar Bach uh, studied at the Royal Academy Berlin. He worked as an apprentice, and then he studied at the Imperial Academy of Art in Berlin. He uh, got famous in his Berlin studio doing exquisitely jeweled pieces. So he worked in silver, uh, famously did a Bible cover for Pope Leo XIII that is still in the Vatican collection. He opened a studio in Venice and he would work between Berlin and Venice. In 1911, he won first prize for metalwork for his design for an iron bed for Kaiser Wilhelm II. In, at the Turin World Fair of 1911. That same year, he moved from Berlin to New York City, where he set up shop first with his brother Max, and they were the Bach Brothers metalsmiths, and then on his own as Oscar Bach metalsmith. And he ran his studio until 1957, but his real heyday was the sort of 19-teens and 1920s. And so Oscar Bach, in addition to our gate here, he did the rain gutters over at Cranbrook House on the 1918 library edition. He also did the magnificent Bach clock in Cranbrook School for Boys. If you've traveled around in America enough, you have certainly seen other metal work by Oscar Bach. Um, So he has work at Rockefeller Center, at the Chrysler Building, the Empire State Building, the stainless steel mural in the lobby is Oscar Bach. Um, All of the sort of grand mansions of Detroit and all around the country. And he was a great sort of publicist for himself. I thought maybe we could see the Bach clock through the windows, but that is not going to happen on uh, on Instagram Live, and the dining hall is locked. Um, but he was, Oscar Bach was a great publicist, and so when he would have a commission like these gates, he would go and find the great department stores near wherever he was uh, installing a custom piece like this, and he would offer the department stores housewares to sale, and that even extended to his work for ocean liners, where as part of his commission to do ocean liner gates and installations, usually in aluminum to be light, he would then ask the ocean liner gift shop to please retail Bach products. And so he was working across media, uh, really any metal that you could work in, including Bach light, which was his own entry into the sort of stainless steel. It was a steel that resisted corrosion. Uh, and one of his um, 40 odd patents that he made throughout his life. And so he worked on in Greenwich Village and then on 17th Street and finally uh, in the British Empire building of Rockefeller Center. And so he was really uh, doing work for all across the country, all across the world. Uh, and these gates were at the height of his sort of influence and renown. He also did work for Christchurch Cranbrook. And I mentioned that he had to solve some problems that were created just because of Aelio Saarinen's designs. And one of those is the sort of nature of working iron, where here he is uh, working with wrought iron. And so he's using iron bars. He's heating them up. He's hammering them into the curls. He's hammering them thinner and thinner. He writes out Cranbrook School, A.D. 1927, uh, within these uh, wrought iron bars. We see more of Sarnin's sort of C's and reverse C's. But when it actually comes to the peacocks themselves, it doesn't make nearly as much sense to do these in wrought iron. And so these are actually cast iron details. And so these are hollow cast little birds. And 
if you, if I don't think that picked up, but you can hear that it is a hollow ringing bird. And so it is this interesting combination of hollow cast iron within wrought iron gate. Now, when the pieces arrived, George Booth, who remember he was an ironsmith, he studied the entire gate and he was deeply disappointed in the hinges. I don't actually know what hinges were used. Um, but Bach sent a team out and they redid the hinges on these gates. Uh, George Booth thought they were too thin and so they were redone. They've been, the whole gate has been restored a couple of times, first in 1983 and then in 2009. Um, and it's been hanging back here since 2013. Now, one thing that Aliel wanted, he actually wanted the uh, cast peacocks to be gilded, and so they would be golden peacocks on top of this great uh, black gate. Now, if we look closely, we see the mother and father peacock, but then there's also the little uh, child peacock. And then if I can find it, it was signed by the studio in four places. So he had a number of people working for him. And so um, who knows how much of this work is actually from the master craftsman um, and how much of this is from the other likely German immigrants who were working for Bach. I don't actually see the signature. It said in my object record when I was preparing for today's live at five tour that it is signed in four locations on the reverse even if i could find it i'm not sure that the camera would pick it up so i don't know if anyone has any questions about the peacock gates as we take our live at five i'll step away from them so that we can again see them in their context and how uh, you come through this rectangular opening underneath the octagonal cast concrete light and then back through the triangular um, pediment. And then we see the number of entrances into the dining hall, which glows like a medieval church directly alongside. And so Sarnin swings us into the courtyard uh, and immediately past his sort of finished medieval church of a dining hall and then into the main courtyard space which of course has Sarnen's other great ironwork the Baldachine which we toured on Live at Five a number of weeks ago and then the octagonal fountain at the center which looks towards the octagonal tower of the classroom building and so you see this sort of series of shapes repeating from the peacock gates through to the dining hall, to the fountain, to the tower, and then all of which is sort of complemented by the way that Sarnin takes these geometries, rectangles, triangles, octagons, and then he animates them with moments like in the peacock gates, there's those curly hues and there's the reverse C's. Well, then in the stone carvings, you have things like these dripping sort of Y forms or these strange, almost stalactite-esque um, capitals here, which have these oval bases. I'm thinking a lot about geometry because tomorrow morning, at 9 a.m., I'll be leading a class of, at Bowden College on <laughs> geometries and architecture. And then even the way that then the stained glass picks up this same sort of idea of a black grid interrupted by curved lines. And so all the different windows and geometric forms that have their own sort of special curly cues. I don't have any record of what Le Corbusier thought uh, about the campus or what he even said at campus. Um, Le Corbusier visited Cranbrook's campus uh, on his one trip to America in 1935, um, and he probably gave his sort of standard lecture. Le Corbusier's English was not great, so sometimes he spoke with a translator, and other times he just delivered um, his sort of pre-recorded standard lecture. 
Hello, the Earls again. Family, family loves to jog. Um, so with that great question about Lake Corbusier, I should mention that uh, we have launched tickets to our next History of American Architecture lecture series. Um, the uh, lecture series will be at the end of January through February, five weeks on Monday nights. And I'll be talking about a history of American architecture through uh, visitors to Cranbrook. So talking about the architects who came to Cranbrook and spoke or visited the student studios and how uh, that sort of serves as this microcosm of American architecture and uh, how we can learn about the history of design through these visitors to this uh, art school here. So you can sign up for that at center.cranbrook.edu. And before January, this Sunday, I will be leading a special holiday tour of Cranbrook House, um, home for the holidays at Cranbrook House. I'm leading it with um, some of the volunteers of Cranbrook House and Gardens Auxiliary. It is going to be a um, special festive tour of Cranbrook House focused on how the Booth family celebrated Christmas and New Year's and the sort of uh, winter months here at Cranbrook. So that is this coming Sunday at uh, 3 p.m. You can buy tickets. Those are $20 at center.cranbrook.edu. So I hope you enjoyed this in-depth look at the Peacock Gates. Um, my hand is about to fall off. It is way colder than I thought it was uh, when I was out earlier during lunch. And I don't think I pointed out from this side where you actually can read it. It does say Cranbrook School, A.D. 1927, right across the middle there. So come back sometime. Uh, next time you're on campus, make sure you come by and check out the beautiful and fairly recently restored Peacock Gates. Um, one of the great sort of examples of American ironwork and one of the best examples, I think, of Aelial Sarnen's ability to design across materials at all scales, from the teacup to the gate to the building to the landscape, um, all the way back down to the rug, from iron to brick to stone. He really thinks of it all, including, I've never noticed how the little kid peacock is resting on these two waves with this sort of diamond link and that doesn't seem to reappear anywhere else um, along the gate. So thanks so much for joining me. I'll be on Facebook tomorrow for another Live at Five talking about George Booth's Bed Hangings by May Morris. I'll be back next Tuesday here on Instagram for another Live at Five. And don't forget Sunday's special tour of Cranbrook House. Um, again, this is Kevin Adkison coming to you from the historic Cranbrook School for Boys uh, with the Peacock Gates. Until next time, be safe, everyone.